Hi, I'm Ferdy Sarov, and I'm very pleased to be here with you today with my good friend David Thornburg. Um, our topic today, and the reason I've asked David to join us, is that the very first topic that we have to deal with is creativity and innovation. And it ties to the idea of STEM education as well. Uh, in our process, we have projects that came from the partnership, and they're divided up among English, math, science, and geography. And so naturally, math and science, everyone would obviously say, oh, well, that's where the focus on STEM is going to be. But as a holistic thinker, I know that you take a different view on that. And uh, we're both musicians and artists, by the way, too, even though my dad was an engineer. And uh, I've, I've played a bit with some engineering companies, worked that way, learned my computing stuff. But I think that uh, we both share an idea that creativity defies boundaries and is really what propels all of these inventions, whether they're artistic inventions or technical inventions. So uh, I guess I could get an amen from you, David, that we're really talking about the same stuff. No it's, question. It's just where we're shining the flashlight or the searchlight yeah. at, at a particular time. But uh, one of the things we've said, and I'd love your reaction to it, is that the goal of education, this is from CAST, in the 21st century is not simply the mastery of knowledge, it's the mastery of learning, and that education should be turning novice learners into expert learners. Now, I submit that is completely impossible unless we're unlocking the creativity and innovation of those students, and that's not possible unless we unlock it within the teachers themselves. So as a first point of departure, what do you think about that, David Thornburg? Well, I would have to agree that if we're going to unlock the creativity of the students, we first have to unlock the creativity of the teachers. But when we talk about turning students into expert learners, I don't think there's a way to do that without totally transforming the pedagogical practice. You're not going to turn students into expert learners if you perpetuate a curricular model that is, for example, textbook driven rather than working with primary sources when possible, or uh, a model that involves students doing authentic projects and ultimately projects of their own design, which leads to creativity, certainly uh, there. Back in the olden days, we used to talk about white collar and blue collar workers. And the white collar workers, well, they were college educated in many cases. The blue collar workers, maybe they were high school dropouts, but they were able to do factory jobs, things like that. Uh, we had the pink collar workers. And, and uh, again, in the manufacturing sector, I think the most famous uh, historical example within the US is, is Rosie the Riveter. You know, mm -hmm. while, while husband's off fighting World War II, Rosie the Riveter was, was working in the assembly line and Rosie was not college educated. Because if she was college educated, she was probably working for the Defense Department, mm -hmm. okay, in those days. But they were doing wonderful work. They were being well paid for their skills, et cetera. Here's the challenge today. A lot of people think that there's still a distinction between white collar and blue collar. No. Today's blue collar worker, in many cases, needs more education than ever before. Maybe at two years of community college after graduating from high school. And I broke my foot about a year and a half ago, and I found something very interesting when my foot broke. There was an x-ray done, and within five minutes of the x-ray, the results were in the doctor's hand, and then he looked at the x-ray himself, and he saw that the uh, doctor who read the x-ray actually saw a tiny fracture that he just didn't see in his first glimpse that helped him finish the diagnosis, get my foot all bandaged up, and send me on my way. Now what was interesting was that the doctor who read the x-ray was not located in the United States. The doctor who read the x-ray was uh, received his, his medical training, his medical degree from the US, but he lived in India. So here you had the case of outsourcing a very high skilled job, very high skilled job. It's not that the high skilled jobs are just going to stay. The difference is that what the doctor in India was doing was rule-based and repetitive. The work that the doctor was doing in the US was not repetitive and was based on more flexibility, understanding the patient, et cetera. I mean, the doctor in India had no idea who I was. You know, I could probably tell my age by looking at the x-rays and counting the rings. <laughs> but, you know, whatever it was, uh, they didn't need to know that because they're working with a piece of data. 
Anything involving data, even if it requires a college education, that can be outsourced. It's going back again, Ferdy. The creativity and innovation is a cornerstone element. And the problem I have with a content-based curriculum is that we are in a situation right now where we're providing students with the opportunity to learn things that are not going to help them in their capacity to learn more on their own in the future. Mm -hmm. So learning how to learn, creating the expert learner, brings us right back to that as the central prize on which we need to keep our eyes. Absolutely correct.